So welcome, and all of you watched the videos over the last couple of days. And so the, the one thing I do want to impress upon you is that the four temperaments, the quadrant, the, the idea that you're going to balance your poem with story or form and music and imagination is not to stick you in a box. It's simply a framework. It's a foundation for your poem. So if you're building a house, you have a very strong foundation. And everyone is going to d dig down, depending on where you live and what the frost depth is, a certain number of inches and pour the footers in every house. And then you do whatever you want to, whatever architectural design you want for your house. Okay, so this is it. This is your foundation. And now after this, you do whatever design you want to with your poems. I want to impress that upon you. This is not sticking you in a box, but it is a very good foundation. It's a very strong foundation, okay? So today what I would like to do is go away from story. The, the two poems you saw on the videos, the oranges, very strongly story-oriented, and Corrine Hill's Power, very strongly oriented. Now this poem, My Father's Rage, is still also very strongly oriented toward poor story, but it has a lot more assonance and alliteration. So I just want to talk about this poem, and then we'll move on to more and more similes, imagination, more and more um, imagination, and we'll talk at the end about imagination exclusively. Hello there. Um. I just had a question. So you said the four temperaments were story, form, structure, music, and imagination. What's the other, what's the name for the other one that we had, like character, plot, form, and language? Oh, that was, I was just, I was just messing around and saying if you did a, writing a short story, this is something you would think about. Okay. okay. So, So there's yeah. no, like, certain name for it? I, I just made it up on the spot. Therefore, okay. I will come up with a name later. <laughs> <laughs> Title is the last thing I do. <laughs> Okay. Duty's um, four temperaments. Duty's four temperaments. <laughs> Stolen from Greg Orr. Um, okay. <laughs> so this is My Father's Rage by Andrew Hudgens. And I'm going to go ahead and read it out loud, okay? As I kicked through the swinging door, the turkey shifted on the platter. I juggled, lost it, clipped the bird with the platter's edge, and the hot meat slid, skittered, greasy on the floor, and smacked the polished army boots of Sergeant Turner, our Thanksgiving guest. My daddy grabbed me by the throat and slammed me up against the wall, which boomed. My mother gasped. I lost my breath and couldn't get it back. You stupid idiot, my father screamed. Then Sergeant Turner touched Dad's arm. Lon, he said, we've eaten worse when we were growing up. Dad sighed and then, reluctantly, he let me drop. But now his crazy rage is gone to whole days watching TV, watching golf, football, news. His rage gone to whole days watching the freaking weather station. And I damn tell I want it back. Okay? So a very strong story. So let's talk about some of the things this poem does, just crack-wise. You see? The story is clear, right? This is something I want to impress upon you. You do not want to confuse your readers. They're just irritates the reader, basically. Okay? Um, so, and as long as you have a powerful story, you, you won't need to do anything other than just tell that powerful story. And if you don't have a powerful story, all you have to do is add similes and assets and alliteration, and it's going to be an incredible poem. Okay? So, this one. Notice how, for example, the very first line, you begin with two short eyes, right? In the next line, what repetition of sounds do you have? T. <laughs> Thank you. Turkey. 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 Platter. And platter. Very good. A lot of people don't think about that when they're writing poems. They don't think about the fact that there's letters all through the words. And something like platter, those two T's in the middle are very strongly pronounced. And so they do count as a repetition of the sounds. Platter, turkey. I have a line in my first book that goes something like, um, the weather wasted letters of the boxcar spelling Illinois. So spelling Illinois, double L's in the middle of the words. And so, all right, so, and also there's a repetition of the vowel from, as I kicked through the swinging doors, the turkey shifted on the platter. What's that, shifted? It's in the next line. Swinging, kicked, shifted. This is something I learned in workshop at University of Virginia from James Kimbrell. He will write a line of poetry and then he will make a point of 
getting a letter from the first line into the next line. So he will choose his words carefully in order to make sure that there is a repetition of sound. So you end up with sounds echoing all down through the poem. And so you have, and I, don't know, I don't know how Andrew Hudgens writes, but I'm sure that he was thinking about that. And the other thing you're thinking about is the best way that the reader is going to hear your assonance and alliteration is if you repeat it three times. So twice in one line, another time in the next line. If Andrew had written, as I kicked through the swinging door, the turkey fell off the plate and then shifted her on the floor <laughs> and put shifted in the third line, that would not have been as good because the, sh the short eye is too far away from the first two short eyes. And Andrew, I apologize for doing that to your poem just then. Um, okay, so as I kicked through the swinging door, the turkey shifted on the platter. I juggled, lost it, clipped the bird with the platter's edge, and the hot meat slid, skittered, greasy on the floor and smacked the polished army boots of Sergeant Turner, our Thanksgiving guest. So the other thing, he's continuing with the short eyes. So the thing I, I tell people, there are only 26 letters in the English alphabet. It's amazingly easy to do repetition of vowel and consonant sounds. A lot easier than doing similes. Uh, so, and the people say to me, well, that's easy for you, Professor Jordan, but actually it didn't used to be easy. If you practice it, it will become amazingly easy. So if you just practice, like everything else, if you practice, it becomes easier. So, you know, he has, again, he has meat like that, and he has platter again. He has the, is there any sh repetition of anything else other than the short I? It's a lot of L's. A lot of L's. You have the lost and... Lost, clipped, platter, slid, floor, polished. I don't know, maybe I'm like reaching, but I feel like there's a lot of L sounds. That's interesting. Yes, there are a lot of L sounds. You're correct. And there's a, I mean, again, it's 26 letters in the English alphabet. So you ought to be able to repeat them, right? Uh, there's also a repetition of something very close and very obvious. S's. There are a lot of S's. Slid, skittered, platters, smacked, boots, sergeant. I mean, maybe, you know, is it possible that Sergeant Turner was really a Colonel Turner, Turner but he wanted to repeat that S? I, th I think that is always a possibility. You can change the narrative in your story enough, just a little bit. So, for example, if you have a, a 60 gallon water barrel, you can change it to 55 gallon water barrel so you get the repetition of the two Fs. So, those little things like that are just little tricks that are just make it so much easier to add assets and alliteration. There's also hot meat slid skittered greasy. Meat greasy. It's almost a rhyme in the middle of the line there. Okay? So the, another thing that I noticed, and you have this, okay, this is, as I, as I kicked through the swinging door, the turkey shifted on the platter. Simple sentence. And then there's this long sentence that goes on and on and really gives you a lot of detail. Think about this. This is something I don't think people often do when you're learning how to write a poem or you're learning how to write a short story. You know, we're reading all these finished pieces and they are extraordinary, right? But think about this. This poem did not start out extraordinary. It got that way through the revision process. So what do you think that Andrew Hudgens' first line was when he wrote this poem, when he first started? When I juggled, lost it, clipped the bird with the platter's edge, and the hot meat slid, skittered, greasy on the floor, and smacked the polished army boots of Sergeant Turner, our Thanksgiving guest. When he first wrote the first draft, what do you think he had written right there? Right. Andrew's not watching. He won't care. I dropped the turkey. I dropped the turkey. Thank you. Boom. Uh, I mean, that, that's what I would have written in the first line. Yeah, and then I would have said, well, okay, well, what did the turkey, you know, I would have asked the turkey some questions. <laughs> or I would have asked the image some questions because I dropped the turkey is an image. It is a clear story. There's nothing wrong with it. So I could have stopped right there and said, all right, there's my line. But fortunately, Andrew Hudgens didn't. Fortunately, he gave us something so much better. He used 
The one thing that I will impress upon you, I hope, is that one of the ways to get more aspects of alliteration is to use more words. And you remember that you are wordsmiths. You love words. And the chances are that your readers also love words, as long as you're using the strongest words possible and you're not giving them too much description, they will love it, okay? So he thought about this and he, he layered, he added on to the image. So he described the turkey sliding around. That may be completely myth, that may never have happened. It's possible that they did not even have a swinging door in their kitchen. It's possible they just had a regular door, but that short eye needed to get in there and kicked through the swinging door gives you two short eyes. It's possible he was holding the turkey on the platter and backed up and tripped over his own shoelaces. All right? But that's not a good, that's not assets and alliteration. So you can change the story around in order to make the poem more musical. And you can add words. So you add, you know, I juggled, lost it, clipped the bird with the platter's edge, and the hot meat slid, skittered, greasy on the floor and smacked. You hear those really strong verbs? It didn't hit, it didn't touch, it smacked. Which is, you know, something we do when we're abusing a kid, right? I'm going to smack you in the next week. No one ever said that to me. Um, <laughs> um, I'm going to smack you silly, I think is the, is the saying, isn't it? Well, okay. <laughs> smack. So, you know, there's these really strong verbs, which is another thing to think about when you're writing your short stories and your poems. Pump up those verbs. So instead of saying something like, I walked through the swinging door, I kicked through the swinging door. See, that's a stronger verb. So instead of saying, uh, the rosemary was growing along the fence, say, the rosemary knuckled along the fence. Or the rosemary thrusting from the ground. Okay. Um, so, and then you, know, you just keep adding, you know, the, we didn't need to know that he juggled and lost it and clipped the bird with the platter's edge and that the meat slid and skittered greasy on the floor. We didn't need any of that to get the story and the image, but we want that because it's music and we love that. That's what we love about poems, is you know, just the, our sheer love of the language. And the other thing I noticed about this is the, you have this long sentence and then you have this you know, medium length sentence and then my mother gasped. Three words. So longish sentence is followed by three words, and that those three words are very strong. They tell you just how serious the situation is, right? <clears throat> and I lost my breath and couldn't get it back. You stupid idiot, my father screamed. Then Sergeant Turner touched Dad's arm. Lon, he said. Up to this point, Dad seems rather inhuman, right? He's the, an angry, abusive father. Now he has a name, Lon. The writer just humanized him by giving him a name. This is why we give prisoners numbers, because we don't want to humanize them. We give Lon a name, and not only a name, but a very soft name. I mean, maybe his name really was Butch, or what's another name that, <laughs> that people get, get, and it's not, you know, it's not a soft name. It's like that Cologne Brute. That's not a soft name. So Lon is a very soft name. So now he's beginning given a name, and it's a very soft name. And then I love this line break. Lon, he said, we've eaten worse. And I'm thinking, army. They ate worse than the army, because you hear stories about how bad army food is. But it's when we were growing up. And then Dad is humanized even more, because now you realize Dad grew up in very difficult circumstances. And he's eaten a lot worse than turkeys that have been on the floor. So he's very humanized now. So he started with this you know, active scene and this very soft, humanizing scene. And Dad sighed and reluctantly he let me draw. And then what happens at the end? We have this, this, how old is Dad now? Dad, Andrew didn't tell us how old his Dad is now, but he did, didn't he? How old do you think Dad is now? 50 plus. 50 plus. Okay, I forgot I was talking to Zoomers. Um, to, a, to a Generation Z, 50 is old. Okay. He seems old and senile. Like, it doesn't matter what his age is, he's clearly lost his uh, relevancy. His power to be angry and it's just melting away watching TV. He's, I mean, he, yes, he's sitting in a chair staring all day long at golf. Um, okay. <clears throat> I don't want to, you know, insult anyone who happens to like watching golf, but I can't imagine doing that. <laughs> um, my brothers all watch uh, NASCAR. 
and, and I, I, you know, when I visit home, I, I, I try, but there's cars going around in circles mm -hmm. for hours. I, I cannot do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, the, but that's what he's doing. He's watching the weather station for hours. He's just sitting in front of a TV doing nothing else, just watching. He's yes, he's definitely he's old, and he's on his way toward the grave. And what Andrew Hudgens ultimately is saying. I don't want my father to die, no matter how angry he was. I don't want him to die, okay? Um, but ultimately what I want you to think about with this is, is the ad addition of assonance, alliteration, the addition of music, how this so nicely balances the story. And also, I do want you to think about the fact that this is not the first draft of this poem, right? And when you're writing, don't stop with the first thing that you wrote. I mean, some of you are geniuses, I know, but most of us are not. So, you know, think about how you can add words to add accents alliteration. And think about echoing the sounds, like using the double, the kicked, swinging here, the shifted here, the clipped here, also it, it clipped. And then we go on to meat and greasy, and then we come back to the short eyes. So there's an echoing of sounds all the way down the poem. Okay? It's going to be, you're going to be amazed at how good your poems are. If you, if you do even that, just get a clear story and then a repetition of sounds. Okay, now on the quadrant, you know, there's story and music is what this poem is. In this next poem, Pit Pony, I think we have a strong story and imagination. Now imagination can be humor, it can be surrealism. Um, the most common imagination you see is similes and metaphors. Now for me, writing similes and metaphors is the most difficult part of writing poems. And does anyone here love writing similes and metaphors? Yes, I see hands going up, awesome. Do you want to share? How? You're, you're, you're. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I just have like a really visual imagination. So like, I just like try to pin like exactly what the feeling or like the, the, like the thing that I'm trying to describe is like in like a way that is just like as much as I can describe it to myself, maybe no one else would get it. And then I try to figure out how I can make it so that other people would get it after that. Like once I figured out what it is, what that thing feels like to me, or how I would describe it, then I try to like figure out like cut it, cut the words away so that it makes more sense to other people. I, I think that's excellent. That's that sounds extraordinary to me, because I mean a lot of what you're trying to do with a simile is explain something to another person that they've never seen before or felt before. So like similes are the one chance you get to use abstractions in a poem. So you can say love, which is an abstraction, feels like. And then you can come up with a pop feels like uh, the circus has just come to town. Right, that's positive, right? Um, I, I, yeah, I like to say love is like Coca-Cola. It'll burn a hole right through you. Um, that's not positive. And I, 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 I just stole that from, I think, Margaret Atwood, maybe Marge Piercy, famous woman poet who uh, hopefully she's not watching. <laughs> and if she is, hopefully she'll come and say it was me. <laughs> okay. Um, so. I mean, I think that's extraordinary. That's exactly what you do. You, you, you know, like when I'm when I'm trying to write, for example, about my, my mother's death, right? And I feel this sorrow. Now, the thing about sorrow is we all feel sorrow differently. We all feel love differently. We are experiencing this room right now differently. If we all right now wrote a poem about this right now, we would all write different poems because we're all experiencing it differently. So, now the thing about similes is you can say how that experience is for you. So I think that's great. I, I'm not, you know, I'm kind of a plodding writer, pedestrian, as Rip Pound would call me. So I have to really, one of the things I've, I've learned to do is write a simile, brainstorm. I've learned to brainstorm. So I'll write as quickly as I can with as least criticism, self-criticism as possible, 10 things on a piece of paper. And the piece of paper ends up looking like, it looks, there's one piece of paper and it just has writing all over it. It's not uh, like line by line, it's just every which way. And then I'll go on like the back page of the other page and I'll draw arrows and I'll draw a little puppy dog here and there, and, you know, just, just doodling and scribbling. And then I'll look through those and I'll maybe combine something or expand something. And I'll think about, you know, I'll just use, 
basically, you know, I, I just brainstorm and then I plod. And that works for me. But, you know, everyone has a different writing style. But I think, you know, what you're saying there is you're trying to, similes, try to tell someone else what you're feeling or what you're seeing. So you're seeing something or feeling something that no one else in the world has ever seen or very few people have seen, and you're telling them how it looks. It's like when, way before you guys were born, in 1969, the astronauts landed on the moon. This was a really big deal in 1969. And no one had ever landed on the moon. No one had any idea what the moon was like. They were really worried. Um, they didn't know if the spaceship was actually going to sink into the moon and drown the astronauts. President Nixon had two letters written to read out to the American people. One was if everything was successful. One is if the astronauts died or could not get back off the moon. The, uh, and they had a gun in the spaceship. So they were allowed to choose how they were going to die. Were they going to slowly starve to death or kill themselves in case they could not get off the moon? Because there was a great fear that they were just going to sink or something was going to happen that was going to prevent them. And so when they got onto the moon's surface, one of the things you hear, um, which one was the first one? The, the, the poor guy, Michael Collier, he had to just float around in space. He was a taxi driver. The other two, what were their names? Armstrong? Well, it's Aldrin. Yes. Aldrin? Yeah, it's Collins. Collins was the one that had to be a taxi driver, didn't get to actually go onto the surface of the moon. So Aldrin and Armstrong got to walk around on the moon, and one of them, I remember, said to the other one, they seem to be really concerned about rocks, so let's pick up a lot of rocks. Um, <laughs> and uh, one of them said, the moon's surface is like plaster. Simile, boom, he just wrote a simile. The moon's surface is like plaster. None of us have ever walked on the moon. But now we know what the surface is like. We can go down to the hardware store and buy some plaster. And the other one said, yes, I was going to say that when you ran your trowel across, it smoothed out, like, I think he said, like concrete. So there you go, another simile. The first astronaut to fly around the moon but not land said the back of the moon, which we've never seen, looks like the high desert. A, video, a simile. They're, just, they're writing similes for us to explain something that we've never seen. So this is one of the reasons that you write similes. And Another reason is, of course, they're fun to write. I, I know, I, I've already said they're hard. They're also fun. Aristotle said anyone who could write a, a metaphor was a genius. So it's always fun to be a genius, mm -hmm. right? So, so Pin Pony by William Greenway. I'm going to go ahead and read it. And you know, listen to the metaphors and similes. There are only a few left, he says kept by old Welsh miners, souvenirs like gallstones or gold teeth, torn from this pit so cold and wet, my breath comes out a soul up into my helmet's lantern beam. Anthracite walls running, gleaming, and the floors iron rutted with tram tracks. The almost pure rust that grows and waves like orange moss in the gutters of water that used to rise and drown. He makes us turn all lights off almost a mile down. While children scream, I try to see anything. My hand touching my nose, my wife beside me, darkness palpable, a velvet sack over our heads, even the glow of watches left behind. This is where they were born, into this nothing, felt first with their cold noses for the shaggy side and warm bag of black milk, poured their trams for 20 years through pitch, past birds that didn't sing, through doors opened by five-year-olds who sat in the cheap, complete blackness, listening for steps, a knock. And they died down here, generation after generation. The last one when it dies in the hills, not quite blind, the mines closed forever. Will it die strangely? Will it wonder dimly why it was exiled from the rest of its race, from the dark flanks of the soft mother, what these timbers are that hold up nothing but blue. If this is the beginning of death, this wind, these stars. He's, you, everyone knows who he's talking about here, pit ponies. He's, he's in wells, Welsh miners, and pit ponies were used to pull the coal out. That's clear in the story, right? And he, I love the way he, he mentions things like the five-year-olds who had to work in the mines. But uh, he doesn't drill on that because that's not what he's, that's not what the poem's focus is. Okay, and we have, let's see, like gallstones or gold teeth, so wet my breath comes out a soul. So we have, you know, simile, simile, simile right up there at the beginning, lots of similes. Uh, the waves like orange moss 
in the gutters of water. And the, the darkness over their heads like a velvet sack. So you've never been in a mine a mile down, but you want to know how dark it is, you can just go get a velvet sack and put it over your head. <laughs> so he, this is what this does. It tells us what it's like. And we can picture the rust. It's waving. It's armed. We can picture that. And what I really like about this poem, though, is he does what we all need to be doing. He thinks deeply about this subject and recognizes what is different in the world to a pit pony than to us. So he takes himself outside of his own vision of the world and puts himself in the mind of a pony that was born in dark and raised in dark and died in dark and said, what is this world like? And you see that when he says, the milk is black. I, that really surprised me. I mean, I've never thought of milk as black, but if you're in complete pitch darkness all of your life, yes, that is what it would be, right? And the m dark flanks of the mother, I mean, the mother could have been a white horse or whatever color horses come in. And but to the pony, it's just darkness. Everything is darkness. And then you get that incredible ending where the pony, well, we're all thinking, you know, we're thinking this is wonderful for the pony, right? It's outside, it's freedom, it's got the world, it's running around in pastures. But what if it's not? This is how you write short stories, right? You, you look at the world that is and you say, what if this changed? What if this other thing happened? It's like um, I'm working on a, a novel right now. When I was seven, my mother passed away, and my mother's family tried very hard to talk my father into putting me into an orphanage. I'm not sure exactly why, but I think it was something to do with the time, 1960s, a man should not be raising a daughter, something, I don't know. All I know is they tried very hard. And my father's family said, that's not going to happen. <laughs> and so uh, a cousin moved in, a, a, a cousin of my father's, and my father's side of the family moved in for a few years to keep me from having to go to an orphanage. Um, but the novel I'm writing is, what if I had gone to an orphanage? You know, what if? Because you know, how would your life be differently? So you, you look at your life and think, what if this other thing happened? You, know, what if you go to the bar, you meet a woman, you don't take her home. What if you did? You, know, what, you find a raccoon in the road that's sick, and the police show up and say, we've been looking for this sick raccoon. But what if the police didn't show up? <laughs> what if? Okay, so, so this is the point, you know, the horse is happy, of course it is. What horse wouldn't be happy to suddenly have freedom out of the mine in the, in the, in the pastures? But what if? What if the horse is lonely? It's the last pit pony. What if the horse is scared? Cut, suddenly coming out of this enclosed enclosure and being out in the open. What, and the pony you know, has its worldview, and its worldview is that there are timbers holding up the sky. What, you know, what, if, what if this is the beginning of death? these winds, these stars. So it's a wonderful way, a wonderful thing to think about in your, in your poems and in your short stories. You know, how do you change, how do you come out of your own point of view and go to someone else's point of view? How do you make things different, surprisingly different? Any, anybody have anything you want to add? Yes, go ahead, Rachel. Uh, so they did actually keep horses in the mines like that for like their entire lives? Yes, I believe so, in, in Wells, yes. There's a, a peace park in uh, Utah, in Salt Lake City, mm -hmm. so every country got to put something in this peace park that they thought represented them, mm -hmm. and Wells is a, a mine a hole going into the ground. Mm -hmm. So that's, they're very well known for their mines, mm -hmm. yes. And children, yes, very young children, here in this country also worked in the mines. And the, and the birds, you guys recognize that image, right? The birds that never sing. Yeah. So, so Finding Something by Jack Gilbert. All right. All right. I say moon is horses in the tempered dark because horse is the closest I can get to it. I sit on the terrace of this worn villa, the king's telegrapher built on the mountain that looks down on a blue sea and the small white ferry that crosses slowly to the next island each noon. Machiko is dying in the house behind me. The long windows open so I can hear the faint sound she will make when she wants watermelon to suck or so I can take her to a bucket in the corner of the high ceiling room 
which is the best we can do for a chamber pot. She will lean against my leg as she sits so as not to fall over in her weakness. How strange and fine to get so near to it. The arches of her feet are like voices of children calling in the grove of lemon trees where my heart is as helpless as crushed birds. What a gorgeous poem. Now, Jack Gilbert does something that if you were in a workshop, you'd be told not to do. So, I say moon is horses in the tempered dark because horse is the closest I can get to it. A, a pronoun without an antecedent. We've all been in the workshop that said don't do that, right? But he does it, and we don't know what it is. But we have just been given this incredibly imaginative two lines. Now, if he continued with that, just imagination, with this title, Finding Something, I would not be reading this poem twice. And no matter how much I loved the imagination, because I would be, what is happening? But I know what's happening because he tells me. He gives us this incredible open, this incredible um, imaginative opening that if you try to parse it down and write a paper on it, good luck. Because <laughs> it's, you cannot really do it. You have to accept it. You have to say, this is gorgeous. I love it. I accept it. And sometimes we do that. And we're allowed to do that with Jack Gilbert because he immediately gives us all this specificity, all this concrete, clear story. So we know what is happening. Machiko, his wife, is dying. And when you have grief, you're going to have, I say moon is horses in the tempered dark. Okay, because horse is the closest I can get to it. So horse, what do you have, a, do you know what it is by the time you finish this poem? How strange and fine to get so near to it. It comes back again. Machiko is dying in the house behind me. The long windows open so I can hear the faint sounds she will make when she wants watermelon to suck, or so I can take her to a bucket in the corner of the high ceiling room, which is the best we can do for a chamber pot. She will lean against my leg as she sits so as not to fall over in her weakness. How strange and fine to get so near to it. What is he near, but that we don't get near to very often if we're fortunate humans? Death. Thank you. <laughs> death, exactly. It is death, and we don't really know what death is. We don't really know how to talk about death. And we all experience grief differently, right? Um, we all react differently to grief. So he has written this incredible opening two lines when he says, I can't find it. I can't tell you what it is. So I'm going to give you this incredible imaginative opening, and then I'm going to give you this very clear story with all of these concrete images and specificity. And then you get, the, the poem is bookended with this imagination. You get to these extraordinary symbols. The arches of her feet are like voices of children calling in the grove of living trees, where my heart is as helpless as crushed birds. And you, you say, okay, the fact of the matter is her, the arches of her feet are nothing like the voices of children, but I don't care. You know, you don't care because it's so incredible. It's, and then you have, of course, that final image, the heart crushed birds, how helpless the heart is when coming to this. So you see how this works. I, you know, I've been telling you to place your reader immediately. I've been telling you, in fact, in the title or in the first couple of lines, tell your reader where they are. And you can do that, you know, in oranges, that he opened with December. All right, that's where we are, we're in December. <laughs> the first time I walked with a girl, I was 12. Okay, we know where we are. This, you're walking with a girl on your first date, okay? You know, you can begin the poem on the corner of Lexington and Grand Street. Okay, we know where you are. Um, you can begin the poem with Pit Pony. Okay, we're writing a poem about Pit Ponies. Right? You can begin a poem with My Father's Rage. Oh, we're writing a poem about your father's rage. We know where we are. You can begin a poem with Last Night at My Uncle's Having Dinner. Okay? In the insane asylum. In, uh, visiting the insane asylum that closed in 1929. Okay? See, you know exactly where you are. He doesn't do this. And 
I'm perfectly fine with that because he gives us this incredible opening image and then he does it. Then he places it in the third line. So it's quick and quickly enough that I don't have time to get mad at him and say, I don't like being confused, Jack. Okay? <laughs> so this is something you can do. He could have just as easily began with, I sit on the terrace of this warm villa. And he could have done that. But then I wouldn't have had my breath taken away with this incredible moon as horses in the tempered dark. Because horse is the closest I can get to it. Because you cannot get close to death. You don't really understand it. I mean, even after you die, you don't really understand it, depending on what your belief is. So it's, it's just this beautiful poem. And it's about death. And then the next poem, also. Now, that poem, I think, was very nicely balanced with story and imagination. You have imagination and then nothing but story and then imagination, which was a nice balance. This poem is pure metaphor. The only story you have is in the title. And you can do that. So the you know, thing that I hope you've been thinking about for the last couple of days is what you are attracted to in poems. Now, what are you? Are you a story-oriented poem? Are you a form-oriented poet? Are you a poem? Okay, you can be a poem. It's okay. Um, you, are you a, a poet you know, who really likes a lot of structures? So, like, uh, was it, what was it Robert Frost said? Writing in free verse was like playing tennis with the net down? I don't think it's exactly what he said, but if you're a poet who believes, you know, that you want to write only in form poems, sestinas and sonnets and strict meter, is that what you're attracted to in poetry? When you read poems, do you prefer lyric poems that don't tell you a lot of story, but really push the similes, really push the music? Or do you prefer, do you like to be told a story? Many of you are short story writers, so I suspect that you probably like a story. It, it seems likely. And you can't, this is something that can change. When I first started writing poetry, I very much was a story poet. I had a story, I wanted to tell that story. I was attracted to story poems. I wanted to read other people's stories. I think that's natural. I think we are interested in other people's stories. Um, and that is, in fact, why we watch movies and read books, right? Other people's stories. So, but as I read more and more poems, and as I got older, I became more attracted to music and imagination in poems. But I still want to be grounded. I still want enough story that I'm not confused. So you can do that by simply giving us the story in the title. If you're the poet who wants to write nothing but metaphor, just make sure you tell us what this is about. This is about Machiko dead. Okay? He manages like somebody carrying a box that is too heavy, first with his arms underneath. When their strength gives out, he moves the hands forward, hooking them on the corners, pulling the weight against his chest. He moves his thumb slightly when the fingers begin to tire, and it makes different muscles take over. Afterward, he carries it on his shoulder until the blood drains out of the arm that is stretched up to steady the box, and the arm goes numb. But now the man can hold underneath again so that he can go on without ever putting the box down. That is an extraordinarily accurate description of what it is to lose someone close to you. You never put the box down. You go on with your life, but you're always carrying that box. Yes. And, it, and, it, and the poem is just a metaphor, right? I mean, we're not literally carrying a box. It's a metaphor. We are carrying this heavy thing. That's a metaphor. Um, but you know, this is what you can do if you're writing poems and you don't want to write a story. You give us the story in the title. And then you give us images. Now, I'm going to talk more about this Tuesday. I'll bring in more poems that are, that are very music and imagination oriented and have the story only in the title. Um, because the thing I want to impress upon you is even though you're not telling us a story, you still need to make sure we have clarity of place and clarity of image so that we're not confused. Okay?